Our next topic is prison reform, and we are going to discuss that with Dr. Artika Tyner. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Tyner is a law professor and director of diversity at the University of St. Thomas School of Law in Minneapolis. So happy to have you with us today. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Welcome. Well, Artika, I was excited that you were going to be here because in reading about you and the work that you're doing, I know that one of the things that you do is you look at what what is going on in education that might be um, detrimental to kids and might form sort of this pipeline for them into a prison. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about that and what you found out and what does that mean exactly? Yes, I, for me, my interest began in, in 2007, and I'll just make sure I have a copy of this so you all can see it as well. But this is a report that was published by the Children's Defense Fund. It's called America's Cradle to Prison Pipeline. Mm. And the reason why this piece was a seminal work and really asking the question of what is the cradle to prison pipeline, how are young people entering this pipeline, and how we can dismantle it, is because it looked at a myriad of different factors. If we look at mass incarceration in America, we know we have the largest incarceration rate in the world, yes. with over 2 million people incarcerated. Oh, my goodness. But when we look at those statistics, oftentimes we forget about children. Mm -hmm. and how children are impacted, how entering into the gateway into the juvenile justice system oftentimes then leads to future incarceration as well. So this report really opened my eyes. I had no awareness related to some of the trends in juvenile justice, had never heard of the pipeline or the school to prison pipeline, but as I read the stories of young people and started to find out more about some of the entry points into mass incarceration, as a civil rights attorney I said something must be done. So that's when I started doing more research uh, related to the work of the Children's Defense Fund, which was founded by Marion Wright Edelman. And one of the quotes that really inspired me is she said, if you, if you don't stand for children, then you don't stand for much. So I said, at that mm -hmm. point, let's take a stand and get a sense of what's happening here. And a few of the statistics that really caught my attention mm -hmm. is that a black boy born in 2001 mm -hmm. had a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. Oof. And for a Latino boy, one in six. So as I started to look at this, I said, what's the gateway? How are young people entering into this web of incarceration? And there are two ways, primarily. Mm -hmm. A young person either has an encounter with an officer in the community, so outside a grocery store, mm -hmm. wherever they are, but secondly, in, in the schools. And that's the part that was intriguing to me. In Minnesota, about 20% of the referrals into the juvenile justice system are from schools. So I wanted to get a sense of what is this school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So some of the contributing factors are primarily related to disciplinary policies mm -hmm. and the arena of being referred out of the classroom through suspension or expulsion and also our zero tolerance policies. Yes. So, so those are some of the trends that we're starting to see but coupled with it is the disparities in that we're seeing in impacting African American youth and children of color more broadly. So I guess it would be good probably if I break it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Starting with the first point of school disciplinary policies. Annually, about 3.3 million children are referred out of the classroom for suspension or about expulsion. every second and a half, a child is referred out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So if we look at that, we know then out of the classroom leads to lack of instruction because mm -hmm. you're not there. So not only is it potentially a factor of going into the juvenile justice system, but also it leads to what some are calling the push out rate, meaning that you're more likely to drop out as well. So if you're, getting, if you're not in the classroom, what are some of the other things that are happening? And for the work here related to the Children's Defense Fund and what we're seeing with the school to prison pipeline, it then becomes a gateway out of the classroom, potentially dropout rates, but also being entered into the juvenile justice system as well. What about going into alternative ed? Is there anything regarding these kids going into alternative ed, the special ed, rather than being discharged out of school totally? There are trends related to being referred into special education, but once again, we're seeing disparities there as well. Primarily, young boys of color being referred out of the classroom into special education yeah. programs. And for me, one of the things that stood out after I started reading this report, one of the things that I did right away is I did a judicial ride along. So I went and I asked the judge, can I shadow you for a day in juvenile court? But what stood out to me, to your point, for a lot of the young people who had a diagnosis of some sort and were referred to a special education program, they were then being criminalized for behavior yes. that aligned yes. with their diagnosis. Yes. So I think the challenge that we see that's widespread is the over-criminalization of behavior, juvenile behavior. 
And it's especially a challenge as we look at cognition and seeing that, you know, we're seeing time and time again that the frontal lobe and the mind yes. is not fully developed until your late mm -hmm, 20s. Mm -hmm. So I think we just have to ask ourselves a question as adults, mm -hmm. how do we treat children? Mm -hmm. right. I was really saddened to hear that black children are more likely to be suspended or expelled from schools. Mm -hmm. This is really disgusting to, to, say, to speak all this, but yesterday I was speaking to actually a former teacher, and he was talking about inner city students and how one of his relatives had to go teach in the worst part of America, in Chicago, where there's a lot of violence, and if he can handle those kids, then he can handle anything. And just like talk, speak, actually speaking about how they're less they're less likely to go into they're less likely to go to college and it really disgusted me that this is a former teacher and when teachers come in with this kind of expectation of these black students <laughs> then yes. how do they expect the students to perform the students can um, see and sense these low expectations yes. of them mm -hmm. yes. they can yes. you know we have good intuition and mm -hmm. it disgusts me because these teachers have low expectations of them and then when they see them fail or oh they're being trouble let's send them out they yes. expect the worst of them and yes. it just drives me insane this yes. is a former teacher mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so just thought she was about so us. Right, Tico, what, what do you do with what nava's posing i mean it's 2014 and when mm -hmm. i hear things like that i think well aren't we supposed to know more about diversity and understanding and 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 that you know it, why uh, why are we getting comments like what nava is saying I think it's a multifaceted issue, but one of the key things that I would say to Nava's point is ensuring that we look at learning as a growth mindset. There's now a body of research coming out of psychology instead mm -hmm. of saying then that learning is for some, or even in my body of research for leadership. Sometimes we say, well, leadership is for a select few. You're born a leader mm -hmm. or you're born successful. Instead of looking at the fact that you can be made that education is really a process similar to a muscle where you're growing and mm -hmm. stretching those muscles mm -hmm. through the opportunity to grow through more learning mm -hmm. and being challenged time and time again. So the challenge then becomes managing expectation to Nava's point, mm -hmm. because then it also is coupled with the idea of stereotype threat and implicit yes. bias right. yes. Yes. for me to look around the room and say a certain kid will achieve that looks a certain way mm -hmm. while another will not. That over time can be internalized and is detrimental to learning and growing overall. So I think we first have to challenge our own stereotypes, our own yes. biases that mm -hmm. impact children negatively. Mm -hmm. Well, teachers are in their classrooms to teach, and we know that you know classrooms can be pretty crowded. Um, mm -hmm. And so if they can't teach, a child is being disruptive and they have to ask them to leave. Um, we know the process then starts with whatever happens with the behavior. It's suspended, a day in the principal's office, um, expelled. Um, but do we find that this continues if there's lack of parent involvement? I mean, like, where is it starting where mm -hmm. this cannot be corrected? Because, mm -hmm. you know, again, they're supposed to teach, and if things are happening and they can't, they have to deal with it. But where is this pipeline starting? Is it just because parents aren't there, and if the parent's not there, they don't feel supported, so then they do end up doing more things, and there's no one to follow through, or there's no one there to advocate for the child? Like, where is this starting? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a wonderful question, Janita. I mean, I think the challenge then becomes when we talk about pipelining, school to prison pipeline, it's easy to point a finger and say, oh, it's a teacher, it starts in the classroom. But one of the things that I really appreciated about this piece, and it is updated annually with state-specific data, is that it looks at from the cradle, and that's why it has this image, mm -hmm. from the cradle to the prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So the disparities that we're talking about, whether I say, well, and nationally, 70% of those who are arrested in the schools are black or Latino. Mm -hmm. that, it goes long before that, mm -hmm. that we start to see some of the disparities related to health care. I mean, a big one that I've just been researching recently is vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Even from zero to three, the growth in vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So then supporting more early childhood education. Yes. So I, yeah, so I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. different pieces to the puzzle, but it can't be just one group of just saying teachers can solve it, parents can solve it. It's one of those things where it's going to take a whole coalition of folks to come together and surround ourselves around each individual child and offer a network of support. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about uh, the prison system and other issues that are in the prison system that um, affect children mm -hmm. as well that are happening in the prison? Yes, I mean, one large one that we're working on in our clinic, which is the Community Justice Project, it's a civil rights clinic at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, mm -hmm. is the prison phone justice campaign. That directly impacts children on a daily basis. Oftentimes, we don't know if a child has an incarcerated parent, but the truth of the matter is, in Minnesota, there's over 15,000 children who have an incarcerated parent, mm -hmm. over 2 million nationally. And a part of the challenge that they often face 
is how do you remain in contact with your parents, especially based upon the fact that most uh, prisoners are incarcerated on the average of 100 miles from home. So oftentimes a visit isn't accessible, so a phone call would be a great way to establish and build those connections in a familial relationship and also to ensure that we're creating connections in our communities that are lasting. Mm -hmm. So if we look at prison phone justice as a, a national and a local issue, the cost of a prison phone call here in the state of Minnesota, a 15 minute collect call, mm -hmm. costs upwards of $17. And I know you may be thinking, I call my friends in Liberia, all over the world for a yeah. fraction of that yes. cost. Mm -hmm. Then why is it? Mm -hmm. So that was the first question that I had. And I, I think my default is maybe this is the way things are. Mm -hmm. This is the way they've always been. But truly the challenge is that most states, prisons, then enter into agreements or contracts with just a handful of private companies mm -hmm. to offer prison phone call service, services in the prisons and jails. And based upon that, they charge a commission or a kickback. So then it inflates the actual cost mm -hmm. of the prison phone call. So in Minnesota, it generates over $1 million in revenue, and the current commission rate's about 49%. Is there any sort of effort to try to create uh, an opportunity for that, for that cost to be diminished or, or even deleted totally if it's a parent calling a child or vice versa? Well, nationally, the FCC has intervened to set some guidelines related to what the call cost should be per minute. However, that only impacts long distance calls that go across state lines. So we still have advocacy to undergo here in the state of Minnesota, but definitely we agree that there should be some way to protect those communications, not only as a civil right, but a human right. Mm -hmm, I mean, that's a mm -hmm, basic human mm -hmm. dignity to be able to pick up the mm -hmm. phone, say, hi, mom, hi, dad. Mm -hmm. So we're actually organizing here in Minnesota with a number of coalition partners to make sure that prison phone calls are accessible and affordable and not limiting the ability for children and families to remain connected to their incarcerated loved ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can really see how it is the cradle to prison pipeline mm -hmm. because if a parent has committed whatever crime, they're doing their time, but if the child now can't even call their parent, mm -hmm. it now, it's, it's sort of like a punishment to the child. Like they can't, because I mean, there's a lot that has to be said. That's their parent, you know, regardless of what happened, mm -hmm. if they're, whatever they've done to that child, that's still their mother, that's still their father. And now here's a penalty now passed on to the child if they can't even make that connection. And I see how it continues on and on and on because what's happening in that child who never gets to connect with that parent and if they don't really have a support system even outside of that, mm -hmm. so then are they in the foster system? Are they yeah. in whatever's happening? You, it's, you can see how that process just continues, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, I am sorry to end the discussion, but we are at time, <laughs> oh. and I just want to say thank you to you. And if someone out there wanted to find out more about the work you're doing, do you have a website, or how could it, would it be at the University of St. Thomas? Yes, they, they can just look up the Community Justice Project okay. and be connected directly to our website. And we also have a Facebook web, web page as mm -hmm. well. That way we have updates and action alerts related to our current projects. Great. Dr. Tyner, we thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And we thank you for being with us today on It's a Woman's World, and we hope to see you next time.